This is a chrysalis, a live chrysalis of the monarch butterfly. Very, very pretty little thing. Bright green with a golden diadem. And um, I've been particularly interested in this in this butterfly. I suppose it's the most famous butterfly in the world now. Now here I got a, a, a set specimen to show you. I could, of course, say that a live one would be more interesting, but this thing actually was caught in England. And so you realize that it has migrated right across the sea from America. And it's a butterfly which engages every year on thousand miles of migration. And it's, it's a wonderful sight to run into a, a migration of these butterflies, which I've done twice. And it's really a, a, a fabulous thing. I chose the monarch butterfly as one of my wonders of the world because and butterflies altogether, you know, are very smart. They smell very strongly and they smell of pyrazines. We didn't know what they smelt of at the time, but that's one of these memory provoking uh, odors. And it's characteristic of butterflies which are poisonous and which have something in them which puts off birds and other predators. And it was, it was always thought that probably the caterpillars sequestered this from plants, but it was never really known. Scientifically, it was just a speculation. Then a very famous chemist, Thaddeus Reichstein, cracked this puzzle and showed that the caterpillars collected heart poisons, rather like digitalis, from the plants they fed on, went through to these beautiful green chrysalises that you saw here, that little sweetie, very, very toxic, and then appeared again in the butterfly. And we found that in some cases the butterfly was very smart and really intensified this poisonous substance so that there was more in it, a stronger um, sort of concentration than there actually was in the plant. I never went to school and I had no education. When I was about 17, I used to go to evening classes at the Chelsea Polytechnic. But otherwise, I learnt all my natural history after my father died from books. Of course, I had all the advantage of his immense knowledge and his extraordinary gift for teaching children. Unfortunately, my father died, you know, when I was 15. And this was such a shock to me that I completely gave up science for two years. And I really then thought I'd be a writer and not a scientist. And then my brother came back from Harrow for his winter holidays or something. And the holiday task was the dissection of a frog. And this luckless frog was put into a jar and given chloroform dissected. My brother asked me to go and help him. And I was so thrilled, but so thrilled with the internal organs of this frog. I thought it was the most marvellous thing I'd ever seen. All the blood vessels, circulation, all this, that I was immediately captivated and went right back straight into natural history and, if you like, a sort of science. When I was studying the jump of the flea, it was very awkward keeping these fleas on wild rabbits because you couldn't see them properly. So I transferred them onto these uh, white rabbits that you see here. And they were ex then, I mean, it's very easy. You turn the ears back because rabbit fleas fix on the ears. You just turn them back and pick off the fleas as you want them. Put them in the box where we measured their jumps. We had a special box for measuring the jump. It was like a drum, and there was a recording machine in it, and every time they jumped, they made a little bang, and this was magnified. And we found that these fleas could jump 30,000 times without stopping. It's really rather a lot. 
considering how energetic they were with their jumps. Well, of course, fleas were the carriers of myxomatosis on rabbits, but the jump was a sort of scientific sideline that I was interested in because one realised this jump of the flea was so extraordinary. I mean, they took off and disappeared. Their, their acceleration was so enormous. The acceleration actually turned out to be 140 g, and that was 20 times the acceleration of a moon rocket re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. So it was quite, quite spectacular. They're rather sweet, aren't they? <laughs> it isn't everyone who has a great love of fleas, but I have. Although I've given them a good dope of chloroform, they're quite lively. Of course, in real life, these hatch out in the nest of the rabbit, and they've got to find the rabbit, so there's a big jump to do. That's why they're powered by jumps. And you see, wings are no good to you if you live in fur. They just get in the way. So as a parasite, living in the fur of the rabbit, they've lost their wings, but they've replaced it by this stupendous jump. And I have described them as insects which fly with their legs because they have got, in, well, you, you call it a shoulder, but of course it isn't really a shoulder, but that part of the flea that um, has in it this resolin, which is a, a sort of, um, like a sorbo rubber material. It's a protein, but it's a sorbo rubber material which can be compressed and then released with great force. That's in the shoulder blade, and that used to be the wing hinge ligament of the flea far, far back in, 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 in before the, they evolved this leg mechanism for getting down to the host. That's really what it is. It's res it's residual bit of the wing. Their feet are so slender that I knew at once that it was impossible with that acceleration to jump from their feet. And so I imagined that they were jumping from their knees. You could study the anatomy of the flea, you could guess this. And of course, here we have the actual photograph we took of the flea jumping. My son-in-law took this marvellous series of photographs. We built a little pyramid for these fleas, and they used to walk up and sit on the top, and that enabled us to focus on the animal, and it was very important to know when the flea would take off. From this little pyramid, they always took off if another flea climbed up. Just when the other flea got there, they'd go off, so that helped you take the photograph. And we had to project the light onto the back of the, uh, onto the background instead of directly onto the flea, otherwise it would have fried it, because the light was so terribly strong. This I always regarded as a great triumph for us, because you see the flea is taking off off its knees. It wasn't even the mechanism of the jump that was so complicated, but it was working out the muscles. Dr. Schlein and myself did the muscle work together. He did his by microdissection, and I did mine by cutting serial sections. I think I cut 6,000 serial sections to work out the muscles. It's quite a job. Mm -hmm.